Welcome everyone. We're glad that you've joined us in this concurrent session. We're going to get started in just a minute. I just want to quickly review a few housekeeping items. We'd like to remind everyone to keep our space accountable and safe, as we've discussed earlier in the day. If you experience any difficulties, please feel free to message me. You can do it on the chat there by simply clicking in the message button and choosing my name. Uh, just to quickly walk you through the tools of this session, if you look, you'll see a, on the far right corner of your screen, you'll see a vertical bar and you'll see little speech bubbles. There's a chat, there's a Q&A, there's the people session. If you don't see it and you just see the event feed, you need to exit out of the event feed so that you can see your other bar and then just click on any of those icons and that'll open it up. So if, if you have questions for our speakers, just click on the Q&A. That's the third icon from the top on that vertical bar and put your question and questions in there and that way we can make sure and track those over for us. So it is now my pleasure to introduce our speakers for this session. First, we have Abdul Hai Thomas. Abdul Hai is a child and youth ombudsperson for the Jacksonville Center for Children's Rights. Also joined is Addison Sims, Restorative Community Catalyzer for the same organization. Dimitri Brewer, Restorative Practices Specialist. We have Kashawn Drummond and Amaya Maureen, um, who are, uh, Kishan, are you and Amaya both youth council leaders at the, okay, at the State of the Youth Program. And so all of you are from Jacksonville, Florida. We are glad that you've joined with us today. Thank you for being here and the stage is yours. All right, thanks for having us. Uh, we're very, very glad to be here. Um, as Tracy previously mentioned, my name is Abdul Hai. I'm serving as the Child and Youth Ombudsperson for Center for Children's Rights. And I'm joined by uh, all of my colleagues. Uh, so two, two of my partners that I work with in our system of care work and two of our youth co-facilitators who are here with us. And today we are going to do a presentation uh, entitled Nothing About Us Without Us. And it is focusing on our system of care approach and our model that we use here in Jackson, Jacksonville, Florida. All right, so we'll begin with our seven entry points and our continuum of support. Good morning or afternoon, uh, depending on where you're tuning in from. So here at the Jacksonville Center for Children's Rights, we have what's called our seven entry points. So as you see on the screen, um, it's very open and it's a slider. Um, there is no proper way in or proper way out. Uh, we Our main focus is meeting people uh, where they're at, families, organizations, individual persons, however, uh, we, however we are able to come in contact with them. So community education and workshops, that's when we, um, we host certain uh, educations and workshops at things like Earth Day, at uh, youth, particip youth participation events, uh, community engagement events, uh, however, it is usually open to the public, and it's uh, racial healing and equity, uh, cultural competence. Um, it could be anything from policy-driven uh, situations. You know, here in Florida, we have a lot of uh, a lot of policy focuses right now with education and things like that. Um, connection circles is the next one. Connection circles is one of the uh, the main drivers of how we meet people. So, a connection circle is a very um, indigenous practice where a group of people literally sit in a circle. And we usually have some type of prompt or topic to connect with each other on. It could be something as simple as just conversation pieces, or it can be used to repair harm. It can be used to um, make big decisions. Uh, it can be used a lot of times with people who are new to each other and they don't know how to connect and create a safer space for everyone to communicate and uh, work with each other. Um, we have the Youth Collective, which is how we know Keyshawn and uh, Amaya. That's what we call SOIP, State of the Young People. That is a, a youth council that has become very involved in our, our local operations here in Jacksonville, Florida, um, from community revitalization projects to the, uh, the book ban that's going on to um, financial literacy, actual literacy in itself, anything you can think of, um, they're, they're, they're involved. They're becoming a very important stakeholder um, in Jacksonville, Florida. We have family circles. Family circles are focused more on things like grief. They're a little more event-based. Um, we do family circles for families who are maybe navigating 
the juvenile justice system. That's a, that's a big pillar of our operations. And that's how we either find ways to repair harm, find ways to make decisions in family situations. And we try to bring people back together as a family through the circle format. Um, we have resilience practices. Uh, resilience practices is a big vehicle that we're using right now to kind of walk alongside people who are experiencing great hardship and the juvenile justice system. Um, we have what's called resilience navigators who are professionals who are very good at uh, advocating for youth and families while they're in these, um, these situations, these continuums like education, uh, juvenile justice system, uh, even health equity and uh, medical justice. That's a big deal right now in Florida as well. Um, and the community conferences. Community conferences are harm-based. They are focused on repairing harm between two parties. So we've had community conferences that are, that are as straightforward as two youth um, break into someone's apartment and the state attorney's office deems it appropriate for us to repair that harm without pressing charges, without the youth being involved in the justice system. So the person who was harmed brings um, their support system, you know, family members, best friends, whoever they name their support system, and the youth who are involved who caused the harm, they brought their support system. So it was their parents, or there was a cousin there, and a friend. And we literally sit down in a circle and talk through what happened, why it happened, how each party feels, and what each party needs to feel as whole again as possible. And then individual systems advocacy. Um, that's our broader work. That's our work that focuses on making a change, advocating for youth in all these systems at the system level. So whether it's a principal, whether it's uh, the police chief of JSO, Jacksonville Sheriff's Office, whether it's superintendents of the educational um, sector, whether it's um, I mean, anyone, anyone who makes a decision that somehow affects a youth's life, we're in contact with them. And we have the more individual systems advocacy entry point. So we work with what's called UF Health, University of Florida Health. That's a very big stakeholder in our medical arena uh, here in Florida. We hold space with them and we find ways to support either youth involved in it or the people who are providing the services, the doctors, the nurses, the, the specialists, the pulmonologists, cardiologists, whoever it is, we find ways to hold space for them, whether it's personally, whether it's professionally, or whether it's making connections between them and the people that they're serving. So those are our entry points here at CCR. So here, as we get into our individual and, and systems advocacy, um, we, we take uh, a unique approach. It's really an emerging approach that's starting to happen here, uh, you know, in, in the academic world and, and in uh, the nonprofit world. But we really embody the idea of improvement science and emergent strategy. Uh, so this is what we base our system of care uh, frameworks in our system of care work in. So these are our theoretical and conceptual frameworks. So improvement science is, you know, we have different principles that we like to follow as we do the system of care work. And really we, we live by the motto, probably wrong, definitely incomplete. And what we just try to do is be as iterative as possible. And this really overlaps with the, this emergent strategy principle where you focus on what is small, uh, you focus on presence rather than planning, you just focus on iteration, you make sure that you reflect, you make sure that you're telling stories about what took place, and you, you really focus and, and function through something we call like a PDSA cycle. So we plan, do, study, act. And we just do this very, very quickly. So we, we plan fast, we implement fast, we facilitate fast, and we learn and reflect as fast as we possibly can. Uh, doing this work. And this just gives us the op opportunity to build as much capacity as we possibly can. So to kind of detail our work that we've done, we started really working with State of the Young People in December of 2021. And we were running into hiccups, you know, of getting youth, you know, attracting youth, getting youth to commit to, to SOYP, getting them to come to functions. Uh, and so we as a team, we sat down and just said, let's put something on the calendar every month. It doesn't matter who shows up or not. Let's just plan. Let's plan. Let's invite. Let's build this infrastructure. And as we slowly built this infrastructure out, the infrastructure got better. We were iterating the work that we were doing. We were getting better. We were building tools. And then 
people started to come to what we were doing. They were joining our efforts and our work. Um, so now, almost a year and a half later, or two years later, we're over 30 uh, SOYP members, so youth council leaders who are very, very involved in all of the work that we do. So we, we operate under a power with dynamic, not a power over dynamic. So we don't have them call us Dr., Mr., Mrs., or anything. You call us by, you know, we really prompt them to call us by our first names in the work that we do, um, no matter how uncomfortable it may be for us or them. So we really make sure that we're working together in our system of care work, um, and they've begun to embody this process with us. So really, we just focus on building capacity, building habits, and really kind of take that Bruce Lee approach where we're just fluent and we just kind of be like water and we change as much as we possibly can. Um, so here are two books that we've really immersed our work in. So one is called Learning to Improve. Uh, this is a phenomenal uh, book to, to read. It, it's more used as a reference book than anything else, but it talks specifically about uh, you know, becoming a learning community and a network learning community within your own organization, institution, or, or, or agency. And then Emergent Strategy is also very, very similar. They have a lot of the same principles um, in the work that, that is being done here. So here with our system of care principles, we really have three principles that we focus on or three pillars in the work that we want to do. So we are integrating restorative and somatic practices, children's rights and youth participation into the day-to-day -day work of system of care providers. So as Addison mentioned, we work very closely with the University of Florida Health, their pediatric department. We work very closely with the state attorney's office and the public defender's office running a Know Your Rights campaign, and also uh, Noble, which is a black law enforcement agency. And we get into the spaces where youth are at in the city, and we have conversations, and they are helping us. They are doing listening sessions. They are helping us design PSAs. They are helping us design surveys. They are helping us uh, design protocols for the pediatric department on how to have these conversations of what information to give and how to give that information. And so as we continue to do this work, everything is, as I mentioned before, it's, it's improvement science based, it's emergent strategy based. Um, so we just kind of get in the, we kind of get in circle, we get in space and just let the wisdom emerge from the conversation. So we'll have very loose prompts, um, uh, not loose prompts, but we have very specific and targeted prompts that we that we design in our circle. And uh, we ask those questions and everybody has their say in, in what's going on. Um, so restorative practices and somatic practices are based on movement, storytelling, reflection, and community building. That's really the anchor. That's like the main pillar of what we're doing. Then we also base everything we do in children's rights. We, we use the United Nations Conventions on the, right of the Rights of the Child or the UNCRC to really drive any work that we do with any system of care provider. And then we want to transition from youth participation, or I'm sorry, from youth engagement to youth participation. So as opposed to getting youth to come to our events, we are, we are working with youth to co-design and co-plan, co-organize, co-facilitate, co-evaluate all of the work that's being done at the system of care level, whether this is our youth participation circles, our youth action series, uh, the work we're doing with pediatricians, the, the work we're doing with the Performers Academy here in Jacksonville, Florida, which is, uh, is, is all about visual arts and, um, and arts itself, visual and performing arts. Uh, so we are, again, as I mentioned, working in uh, hand in hand with the youth, uh, and there's really no hierarchy into how we approach our work. Um, so Dimitri, would you like to, to talk about how we practice, how we are a community of practice? How are you doing? I'm Dimitri Brewer. I'm the community outreach specialist for the Center of Children Rights. Uh, and we usually take a community of practice approach where that is bringing all the network that we've built with the system of cares that we, the system of care the schools, we'll, we'll say with the schools, with DJ, DJJ, that's the uh, Department of Juvenile Justice. Uh, 
with DJ J with uh, the school board with Na uh, the the Black Police uh, the Black Police Union um, and several other organizations UF Health U the US Fiber Program where with this community of practice we focus on uh, iteration giving you the permission to fail building capacity storytelling and reflection and all these go hand in hand like Addison said you can start wherever uh, we do not usually choose is just where it comes at but um, we see important things with each one of these which each one of these factors starting with the storytelling and that's giving the story to build connections with somebody then reflecting on that story not seeing not to diagnose but just to understand the commonalities of everybody iteration to we want to keep getting better um, giving that permission to fail, understanding that sometimes you don't see the brighter side, but it eventually will come, even if even if you don't see it, uh, and building capacity. Um, and that's what the community of practice does. That's the storytelling. That's what it does. At the end of everything, you build capacity because now you're building your system of care. You're building your network. You're building on everything that you're able to do uh that's what i have yeah so we we take it you know in the in the work that we do we we definitely focus on the storytelling aspect and the building capacity aspect because this is a unique approach right this is almost counterintuitive uh to everything that we've been told since we were children you know that you have to have a hierarchy that everything has to be linear that you know, youth need to just kind of do what the adults say. So this has been a learning process for all of us. You know, there have been times where I have been incredibly uncomfortable. You know, my background is 13 years in education as a as a teacher, as an assistant principal, dean of academics and discipline. And you know, I was always here, and you know, the students and the youth were down here. Um, but CCR, the Center for Children's Rights. SOYP or State of the Young People, it really gives us an opportunity to do the internal work so we can do the external work, right? So if we're unable to repair harm within our own agency or within our own families, you know, we can't go out into the community and do this, right? And we can't encourage them to repair harm themselves and embody children's rights and youth participation if we're not doing it ourselves. So this, so Center for Children's Rights is, you know, the only organization that I've run in, uh, that I've experienced in my career, where I'm able to actually do the internal work so we can do the external work, uh, which has been incredibly beneficial. And to break that down even further, what we've seen uh, through using this type of, you know, the community of practice type of approach, we've seen, like you said, relationship building, uh, being in the intergenerational space, space and uh, to be able to build a coalition through all of that. Right. So in, in that community of practice emerges this, you know, what we call our system of care dynamic. And we really entrench ourselves. Number one is not to be a watchdog, right? As a child and youth ombudsperson, I'm not a watchdog. I am not coming in uh, trying to tell you what you're doing wrong as an organization or really take complaints from youth because I am so entrenched and also, you know, SOYP and, and Dimitri and Addison are so entrenched in what's happening at these different facilities. We already know what's happening because we're there. We're running connection circles. We're building relationships with the youth. We're building relationships with the staff. So that's the real. That's the way that we approach this: is we want to be in right relationship with ourselves. And if you want to learn about right relationship, you can research Dr. Fania Davis. Um, she kind of coined this term about being in right relationship. So we're in right relationship with ourselves. That way, we can be in right relationship as an organization, and therefore, we can be in a right relationship with other organizations, institutions, and agencies throughout the city. So when we come in, 
you know, there's no fear, there's no power hierarchy, there's no, you know, power dynamic. It's just simply like, hey, we're here to work with, the, we're here to work with the youth and make your facility better. And we're here to learn with you at the same time. So we focus first on relationships with the youth. Then we build relationships with the staff. And the next thing we try to do is get together in this intergenerational space. So one example is our Know Your Rights campaign. So we do this at we do this at the the Duval Detention Center with incarcerated youth. We also do this at Grand Park Alternative Education Center, which is our alternative education school where students get in trouble, uh, you know, for various offenses. They get kicked out for 45, 90, or 180 days. And we will build relationships with the youth and we'll say, hey, what do you think about us bringing state attorneys in here, prosecutors in here, defense attorneys in here, judges in here, and sitting in a circle and having a conversation so we can break down those barriers and strengthen relationships. So as opposed to seeing somebody in a uniform or a shirt and tie or a judge's robe, we really focus on you know, taking that perception away and really bringing the human being out in, in our circles and in our restorative work. So we're able to build great relationships through that, build that intergenerational space of, you know, 45 year olds with, you know, youth in the city. And these individuals are making policy decisions for that affect those youth every single day. Then we also create interagency space where we stop doing things in silos. Right, that's the one thing we do. So we've gotten to the point where our motto is real work only. And we simply say, we're not gonna come somewhere and table. We're not gonna sit down and tell you what we do. We're just gonna do it with you, right? So we, we try to get the agencies together as much as possible uh, to have conversation and find the intersection in the work so we can build a coalition. And from that has emerged a coalition called the Youth Action Series, where we're focused on the small P projects, the very hyper local work, where we are doing a community revitalization work uh, with SOYP and, and various community stakeholders throughout the city. Uh, and we'll let Keyshawn and Amaya speak to that. Uh, and we also, you know, have them help us with that big P work where they're sitting in front of policy, you know, uh, people who make legislative decisions and politicians and judges and lawyers and police officers. Um, so they help us on both fronts. And our job really is to get them in these spaces as much as possible. And if I can add, sure. the, main, the main driver of that, let's get back on the slide. The main driver of that is storytelling. So where a lot of um, the, the conflict and the barriers are built is through, like you said, perception of roles, perception of positions. So whether it's a, you know, a, a school, a school district, uh, district officer, or um, you know, an officer that's placed in an actual school, the resource officer, it's stories. So that youth has a story. That youth has a whole story that is supposed to be told in a snapshot of one situation, of one action in that situation. And same with the resource officer. They have a whole story. That story is usually longer because they're usually older than the youth. And they have a whole story. And their action is, is limited and cornered and narrowed down to one action in a situation that was built up from a long story. And the main driver of breaking down these barriers and this contention and this conflict in spaces where youth are you know, being seen as troublesome or the problem or whatever, or the manifestation of problems is storytelling. And everyone has a story. And once people are able to tell their story, that wall drops, those barriers start to lessen, lessen and lessen. And that's when we can start building relationships. And those relationships advance to the intergenerational level once the stories start to mend. Once people see their stories are the similar, are similar if not the same. And then once we break those generational lines, we, we're always looking for opportunities to get someone else involved. We don't, we don't gatekeep, we don't try to own none of that. We are a small piece of a massive puzzle. And we've realized that the, the best way to trigger or you know, catalyze change is by realizing you're a small piece and just doing your part and invite others to do their part instead of holding, like Abdul said, there's a lot of siloing when it comes to the nonprofit world 
youth engagement world, whatever it may be. There's a lot of siloing. These are my kids. These are, this is my youth. This is my youth group. This is my collective. I'm going to do the best for them. And we're going to look the best and we're going to shine and we're going to take over. Everyone doing that leads to very limited progress. And we probably, we have a, we have a partnership with probably five to six other youth collect, uh, youth collectives right now. And we're always looking for ways to get into their space. We're always looking for reasons to invite them into our space. If it's convincing them, hey, well, we're going to be, you know, in a neighborhood that's experiencing an exponential level of gentrification. Um, it's a neighborhood. There's grass. You're, you're an environmental group. You want to come? We, we find the connection wherever we can, wherever we can do it. And once you realize everything is connected, there's a reason for everyone to be everywhere. There's no reason for anyone to not be involved, whatever you can think of. So that's when the interagency space, every space is, is interagency. Every space is completely open. We, there's no exclusivity. There's no, okay, you come here at this time. You come here at that time. We try to get everyone in front of everyone else as much as possible. And once those relationships are built between the interagency spaces, those interagencies have already intergenerational spaces. They're comprised of those. You know, it's the, the employees, the staff, whoever it may be, and then there's the youth that they're serving. They're already intergenerational. Once we create that, that network, it becomes a nexus of a coalition. And it just happens naturally. It's how humans are built. It's how we're designed. It's what we naturally do once we open ourselves up to connect to others. Yeah, Addison, that's profound. And, and, you know, as we continue to do the work, we acknowledge how uncomfortable it is and how uncomfortable it can be. That's an acknowledgement that we all make and we do give permission to fail. So, you know, Saturday we, we painted our second house in the Youth Action Series and, and we'll get into that a little bit further. Um, you know, but we, we made some mistakes, but those mistakes, uh, but we pulled away the most important piece was that we were able to get 30 people together on a Saturday. We were able to pull our resources. We were able to get contributions. We were able to do this thing ourselves as a coalition to revitalize a particular community in the urban core here in Jacksonville. Um, so now I want to give, uh, you know, Keyshawn and Amaya, uh, uh, you know, many moments to speak about their experience in the system of care work, you know, particularly these intergenerational spaces and also this coalition that we've built, which has emerged as the Youth Action Series. Hello, um, I'm Amaya and uh, I recently, not recently, but I joined SYP maybe five months ago. Um, the thing about SYP, they are very um, involved with connecting other youth collectives to each other, like Addison was saying, um, like finding those tethers anywhere that it's possible. Um, you see on this graphic, like SYP is kind of like the um, like the anchor, in my mind, at least. And they have all these other strings with all these other people, um, groups that can all come together to um, put their efforts towards causes that they find important. But my experience so far, it's been really good. Um, we've, as Abdul Hai said, we, um, we just painted our second house and we went back, the first house we did, we like, we did it, like it was a great, we did a great job, but we didn't really do like all of, uh, we had to, Re, not revamp, but um, go back over the trim and like make sure it was all right, which really speaks to how he was saying that, um, that it, I don't remember what he said. It was like, we, you won't get it. Like, it's probably not right the first time, but uh, at least we tried is, I don't know what he said, but something like that. Yeah. And I think that with SOIP, we, um, they don't like, they make it very hard not to participate. Like, like if you don't participate, you really have to be trying not to, because he'll give us rides, um, like provide transportation everywhere, um, and provide food, all all these different things. And uh, I he he's very open, or SYP is very open to helping other groups as well. Like uh, I 
I ran for the president of our of my NAACP chapter, and I won. And we're kind of like uh, slower right now with uh, gaining active members and all of those things. And uh, they're very open to helping us participate uh, in these sort of group events, like the house paintings and things like that. The youth action series as a whole, like with UCI, the Urban League, um, all these different things, it provides so much opportunity, like like access to trainings and stuff like that. I recently went to one, it was like eight hours long, and it was um, women's activism training with the, the Dolores Bar Weaver Policy, Policy Center. And uh, they just taught us how to like mobilize and how to use our voices to help our communities. And I wouldn't have gotten that opportunity anywhere else. Uh, I see a lot of people, a lot of my friends, they are hesitant to, to participate because they haven't, um, they haven't really gotten their feet in the water at all with this sort of activism work. And that, that was me like literally five months ago. I did not really participate in any of these organizations. And just from now to then, like I've accomplished so much and it's all with the help of all these organizations coming together. I think that you, like as youth, we, ha we do have to sort of be involved in our communities because like, the, as like the adults are kind of like not aging out but like they're kind of like moving towards uh, a different venture the, the youth are going to have to step up and help our communities I think and yeah I think that's all I got That's beautiful, Maya. No, I love that. I love that. I totally agree with you. Um, I see we have. Hi, hi, everyone. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Go. Ahead. Sorry, Keyshawn. Go ahead. Um, hi, everyone. I, my name is Keyshawn Drummond. I am a youth council leader with um, SOIP Lacamaya. Um, I joined SOIP. I want to say last fall, but my relationship with um, Addison, Dimitri, and Abdul High was from. Um, like Addison said earlier, the connection circles at the sanctuary on 8th Street, um, which brought me to know that it was basically more of a safe place, which is basically what SOIP is. Um, SOIP has started to be in a safe place for us teenagers to come and to also get out into our neighborhood to revitalize it. Um, we've also, like Amaya said, been in connection with different organizations as a liaison I'm going to say that wrong again. Liaison, I think I said it right. But um, I've been with Brownwood Jacksonville and with the school district. Um, SYP has also started to help um, us get, like, start and start trailblazing for mental health. Um, we were recently a part of the mental health conference with Duval County, which um, let us know that, I'm sorry, which let us youth know, like, that are in schools that people, people just like them are also doing this. So therefore it's good enough to speak up. So yeah, that's all I, um, I love about SOIP. Love that, Keyshawn. So I have a question for everyone. Uh, Jamie Beckett said, I know you covered this somewhat, but could you give some more explanation about how you built partnership, most specifically with the government systems for them to see the value in your work? Well, um, oh, you got it. Oh yeah, no! I I have to give uh, that credit to Abdul High Addison Sims. Uh, they put their boots on the ground and they just got emailing, uh, showing up where they're at, uh, meeting the meeting uh, those entities where they're at, and applying pressure to them at every stop that they could. Uh, and that was the the best way I could explain it, and the best way that it that it happened. We just met them where they were at. And we applied pressure, uh, Addison. Okay, yeah, yeah, I can speak as well. Um, so there's definitely a balance it has to be, um, you know, upheld. And it depends, on, of course, it's relative. It depends on who you're working with. But a lot of it, like Dimitri says, has been showing up um, in their spaces. When he says where they're at, he literally means in their spaces. So um, one of the main ways that really gave us a lot of, I guess you could say, like, you know, respect 
with just the, the juvenile court system here in Jacksonville, Florida, has been we show up in Hope Court. So a lot of youth are selected for what's called Hope Court. Um, if it's their first charge or very lesser charges, misdemeanors, um, we show up in Hope Court. We walk with the youth and we help them navigate that system. The resilience navigators do whoever you know we can we can fit in. Um, and the court system seeing us show up every single time in some capacity. Sometimes it's just to help regulate. There's a youth going through a very troubling situation and you know they're just struggling with regulating themselves. We implement our somatic and restorative practices just to share space, just to be a body if their family can't make it or if they have no family. You know, if they're in the dependency system, which you know is foster care or relative caregiver, whatever it may be, if they're in that space, and we're just there to say, I'm here to just walk with you. I don't have the answer, but I'm here to help you find it in whatever way we can figure it out. Um, there, there's those ways. And there's also, there's the academic um, avenue. You know, a lot of organizations and governmental systems are academic based, they're statistic based. Um, they're focused on, they want to see data, they want to see analysis, they want to see research. We have that as well. Um, we take very, what, we take stories, and stories can still be told through data and statistics. Um, at uh, that, the, the uh, alternative school, Grand Park Educational Center, we took their stories, their experiences of going from getting suspended once to being completely kicked out and sent to the alternative school, that last step before your process in the juvenile justice system. We tell that story through, through statistics. Who sees that continuum? Who doesn't? How many times? How many warnings? Whatever it may be. We still tell that story through statistics. And those more academic-centric um, partners and governmental agencies, that appeals to them. Um, so when we say meet, where, where, when we say meet them where they're at, it can mean physically, it can mean in terms of expertise, um, whatever it is. A lot of partners, we just go help what they're doing just to show we have sweat equity. We're going to do whatever we can to help the system of care in Jacksonville. If it's a shelter, we'll just go and help pass whatever out may be. We'll just, sometimes we'll just go somewhere and move stuff around if they need muscle. Um, we're just there to help however we can. And we show we're here to help, and we're also doing our own avenue of what we're doing to help. We're going to do it regardless, with or without you. We'd love for you to come, but if you don't want to, that's fine. We're going to do it anyways. And that's one of the main ways we've gotten by in. It's showing that we're going to do it regardless. We would just love for you to join because I believe we can multiply the impact with you present. So um, that's just some of the ways that come off the top of my head. I feel like I can answer that from Jim. Yeah, definitely, yeah. Addison. I think you answered it very, very well. You know, so going back, it's it's really all about relationships. That's one. And then, you know, also just saying what you do, do what you say. You know, we really um, we we really hold ourselves accountable to where if we we meet someone and, and we exchange business cards and we tell that person we're going to email you tomorrow at 8 a.m., you know, we 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 email you tomorrow at 8 a.m. You know, that is that is a focus. So there's a lot of integrity to our work. Uh, we also, you know, we also just come from a very ethical and moral perspective. You know, as I mentioned before, we don't come with, con you know, uh, with contention. We simply come with, hey, we know that you want to help these youth. We want to help these youth. How can we do this together? How can you, en how can we enhance your organization? How can you enhance ours? So that's really the way that we, we focus, um, uh, with with relationships, we also, you know, we don't re-diagnose what we already know, right? As Addison just mentioned, we just did a youth participation circle at Grand Park where we worked with a fo focus group of youth. And we took them through, uh, you know, from January to March of 2023, we, we took them through, uh, you know, close to a dozen circles where we asked very specific questions about their experience in the hearing office process. So as we wrote the report, we didn't really diagnose the problem. We didn't say, you know, there's a great disparity in what you're doing. And, you know, this is based in racist practices. And, you know, this is unjust. You know, we didn't come like that. We came from a very, very objective point of view. We let the previous literature, uh, because we did an extensive literature review on it. So we let the previous literature and we also let the voices of the youth speak for itself. So as you see here, we grounded our work in the UNCRC, which is what we do with every facility. 
So when we work with Grand Park, we consider these youth incarcerated because they've been kicked out of their home school and put, um, you know, in, a, in the penal system. So we identified the two articles that we wanted to do this work through, which was Article 12, which is respecting children's views. And that's what we base it. We base all of our work in Article 12. And then we more specifically pulled out Article 40, which is the how children are treated when they are in the penal system. So we wanted to make sure that that youth are treated properly with human dignity. And they also have the opportunity to rehabilitate and reintegrate back into systems, not institutionalize them or criminalize them. Um, so as you see here, some of the, you know, some of the data says, you know, did you attend your hearing? And, you know, over 60% said that they did not attend their hearing. I mean, this is a huge violation of Article 12, which we base our work in, but we don't need to say that, right? We just present the data and say, hey, here, 60, 60 some odd percent of our youth did not even go to their hearing. Here's a recommendation for that. So that's another way we build a relationship. And then also, did you get a 45 day review? So, so some youth, uh, I think statistically, 80 some percent of our youth that we surveyed, which were 70 students, were put there at Grand Park for, over, for 90 days or more. And they don't get a 45 day review, meaning this is a violation of Article 40, the penal law, you know, of, of the, the human dignity piece uh, and also the reintegration and rehabilitation piece. But again, we don't re-diagnose that. We just simply say, here's what the here's what the data says. Here are the students experience. Here is here are our recommendations. So we always offer recommendations to what we're doing. So that's another way, uh, Jamie, that we built relationships. So I know there are a few more questions here. Um, Addison, yeah, you're yeah. going to take them. Yeah, yeah, we have Katie. So Katie said, how did you initially get young people to want to join a youth participation service? Uh, how did you promote slash explain them to make joining feel interesting like a safe space? So the core of that was our connection circles. At Can I answer that? You want to? Yes, yes, go ahead. So basically when we start our circles, um, we don't use um, I statements. We normally we use we to make it feel like we're all in this together. Um, I can't even see the question anymore, but I, I believe, hold on. Can, can I get the question again? I can't even see her question. Yeah. Like How did you get young people to want to join the youth participation show? Okay, so um, we basically, um, we get, how do you get us in it? Well, for us, um, we know, we were already, um, first they came around, Addison, Abdul, Hyde, Dimitri, they came around a lot to show that they're there for us. So then once we started to see that they're there, they're not just here one time and to shut us out and leave us out the door, um, my group, we just said, okay, let's start doing it. Once we got in the circle, um, we basically, he discovered us with the ground rules that we're in this together. Um, so we didn't do I statements. We didn't do, we did we statements. Um, we also um, discovered this process as each other to heal us okay. faster. And it actually helped since in. we were in this together. So basically just to do it as if it's your friend on the street. That's how they helped us. What, Feel more uh, the the and I thank Keyshawn for that. That that's how we that's how we did the the recruitment process more so for the the state of the young people for the youth participation circles. Uh, me Abdul High Addison and another uh coworker, we uh had discussions with the principal, the vice principal, and the dean to uh select a certain amount of kids that uh at Grand Park because they're all in the same criteria. But we, we we was focusing on the 90 days to 180s due to us being able to do the project and having the research go, uh, go longer. So it was a four to six week project. So we needed those youth and they chose at random those youth. So then that's how we got them in. It was more so, but once they got in, we gave them a choice to say, hey, do you want to go through this research process with us? 
this diagnosis process with us. And if they said yes, they, they would stay. If they said no. I mean, we had like 10, 10 to 12 youth, um, only one left. So it was 11 youth, but we gave the decision for them. I mean, they gave us their decision if they wanted to stay and continue in it, if they wanted to uh, to not be a part of it. So that's how we did the youth participation at uh, the alternative school. Okay. And I can add, um, so at the same alternative high school, I'm running, um, you know, at the same exact time, concurrent connection circles on the bottom floor. And what was um, explained to me by youth who are in both circles, is they, they liked feeling like they were a part of something that mattered to them. Um, I was told that the youth felt like, so many times, service providers, agents, whoever it may be, they come, collect data, and they leave, and they say, we're going to do something really important with this, we promise. And then that's it. Yeah. These youth saw the value in this process, the data collection, the, the listening session, the conversation, the debates, whatever whatever they were you know, utilizing that day as forms of communication. They realized that this is by me, for me, immediately. It's, you know, someone doesn't come, there's an, there's this extractism that exists in this new youth engagement, you know, movement or trend where they show up, maybe I'll give you $10, tell me your worst story, I'm going to dig up your trauma, and then I'm going to get out of here. And these youth realize this is progressively, incrementally still about me, with me, and I know it's it's going to be for me in the long run because I'm so involved every step of the way. To add on to that, it was a big buy-in on saying, hey, this is not about me. It's for me, meaning me as my as our people, but it's not about me because a lot of times we couldn't help their current situation, their 45, their 90s, their 180 days. We couldn't help that situation, but it was more so they came together and they said, hey, we'll do it for the next group of kids. We got one girl. She did have a 45-day review. And she had 180 days and she was able to, to leave Grand Park at the 45, 50 days. Uh, but we had other kids. They was kind of frustrated, like, why don't I get it? But they stayed the course of saying, hey, this is not for me as of right now. This is for the next that come, the next crop of kids that might have to come here, you know, so that. So as, as we get into each facility and each organization, you know, we usually start with the connection circles, which are a six week process. And that's where we build really, really strong relationships with the youth and also with the with the system of care providers. And from that, we begin to, you know, uh, if you show interest in, you know, doing a little bit more for their community, we begin to say, hey, we want to let everyone know we also have State of the Young People or SOYP. You know, we're focusing on bringing restorative and somatic practices, children's rights and youth participation to system of care, to Jacksonville system of care. And we work very closely with system of care providers and we name who those providers are. Uh, we say, you know, we would love for you to help us in this. It would be a great way to bring your voice to what's going to affect you, to what is already affecting you. And it's also going to help you build an incredible network of people um, and activate a network and really leverage your social capital and your social network. And that's one of the secrets of kind of what we do. We acknowledge that the social network and social capital that you have is better than ours. Right. And so we need theirs more than they need ours. That's really the approach that we take it. You know, I may be wrong, but that's really our philosophy. That's our that's our approach. And so we want to bring these two social networks and, and this social capital together and begin to become a working network in a community of practice, um, as we mentioned. And so from that has emerged this coalition of stakeholders where we are working with all of the people that were mentioned um, in, this, in this previous slide over here. Um, sorry, I'll try, I'll find it right here but UF Health, DJJ, 5,000 Role Models, UCI, so on and so forth. And we all met January 21st, 2023, uh, and we decided to start this Youth Action Series, which works with homeowners, residents, and various community partners and leaders to disrupt, disrupt profit-led gentrification uh, in this Sugar Hill area. 
and we want to establish it as a historical community in the urban core. And from that, we have already been able to uh, build incredible relationships with the University of Florida down here, you know, down in Gainesville with their, their fiber department or their fiber institute, which is all about uh, building a resilient environment throughout, uh, throughout Northeast and Central Florida. We've already been, we've been able to, to paint two houses, you know, in the past two months. As you see here in this bottom left picture, uh, we support small local black businesses. And uh, as we have them do work with us, we ask them to train our youth in whatever work is being done. So here you see two of our young men uh, being trained in how to pressure wash homes. And then uh, youth are really embodying how to paint a house, what goes into it, you know, how to paint, you know, how to prime, how to trim, how to cut, how to edge, you know, and these are first, these are firsthand experiences that, you know, they've never experienced and some of the adults have never experienced at this point in time. Um, and we are able to add value uh, to the community through that work. Uh, part of the Youth Action Series is the youth participation circles that we've been doing. Uh, this mental health uh, avenue that Keyshawn is really pushing for SOYP, he's really leading that uh, for you know the youth collective, which is incredible. So if you see here in the top left corner, this is what the house looked like when we first uh, assessed it and and got the homeowner's consent uh, to to paint their home. And this is what it looked like on the bottom right uh, after four hours. We had about 50 people from the community. We had uh, local universities. Uh, all of our system of care providers that we've built strong relationships, they were there. Uh, we have paint donated. Uh, the mis tinted paint is donated from a local shop here in Jacksonville. Um, and we were able to uh, beautify this house. Uh, we did one right across the street. But as Amaya mentioned, we learned some lessons as we were doing this. And we're going to go back and we're going to you know, clean up the lattice on the bottom get our youth to understand how to how to do that restoration work too. So that's another element that we wanted to start adding uh, to our work here. Um, so so that is really our system of care approach. Uh, as we mentioned, it's, it's all about improvement science. It's all about emergent strategies. And it's just really uh, trying to, to work as quickly as we can and learn as quickly as we can uh, through relationships. And, and storytelling. Um, so, so any Addison, Dimitri, Amaya, Kishan, any anything you want to add here? Uh, I mean, hey, I just this is the work that we do, and uh, there's many more elements that go into it. Uh, but again, for for building a system of care, it's just about I always feel like it's about putting those boots on the ground and meeting someone where they're at. And uh, because you can't have nobody move until they're ready to move. So that I think that's our key focus of what we do as an organization with, with the youth, with the, the, big, the big wigs and the, the big law offices and stuff like that. We meet them where they're at. Uh, and I feel like that's the most important part of building a system of care that cares, you know? Does anyone have any follow-up questions for our panelists? Well, um, Abdul Hai, I can put that link in the chat now while I go over our closing information. Do you want to talk a little bit about what this form will do? Yes. Uh, so we we were asking that um, this document. Uh, be filled out. It's a demographic. We're trying to collect demographic data for a particular grant that we're doing this work under. Um, so if you could fill that up out, that would be great. Um, you know, that would be phenomenal for the work that, that we're trying to do to collect as much demographic data as possible uh, so we can include on our reports. Um, also, I know that Tracy shared the Youth Action Series link many, many times. Uh, so if you want to see the work that we're doing, um, and, you know, if you're around, possibly join or, you know, you want to replicate it in your city, we would love to, to sit down and, and have a conversation 
you know, uh, and, and become thought partners and, you know, expand our network into different parts of the country to see what you're doing too, because I'm, I'm sure your system of care work is phenomenal too. So we would like to, um, to work as closely as we possibly can with you. I mean, we work with organizations in Chicago and Philadelphia, Ojai, Calif uh, Ojai California, you know, um, we even got some, some international traction here starting, you know, soon. Um, so we're trying to build as, as the strongest network that we possibly can. Awesome. Um, Thank you all very much. Oh, I'm sorry. Did I interrupt? Oh, you? no. And I was saying, you know, uh, if you want to check out our website, jackccr.org, uh, we would love just you can email us and, and we'll be back to you as soon as, soon as we possibly can uh, and, and hop, probably, you know, hop on a virtual call. Awesome. All right. Well, join me in saying thank you to Abdul High, Addison, Dimitri. Amaya and Kishan, thank you so much for sharing your time, your experience and your expertise with us today. To those of you who attended, thank you for being here. Please take a few seconds to click on our survey. It's the second icon from the bottom. It looks like a square with some check marks. It's a very quick survey just to give us a little bit of information about your experience here today. It'll take all of about 10 or 15 seconds. Our next session will start at on top of the hour, it's three o'clock central time. Oh, I'm gonna to have to math in public. Three o'clock central, four o'clock Eastern and 1 p.m. Pacific. Uh, Bethany Boyk will be sharing her experience, strength and hope as a young person living with schizophrenia. Between now and then, we invite you to take a break. You can also scope out the resources, the booths, the lightning talks and the other um, possible resources and opportunities as part of our offerings on AirMe. If you have any difficulties, you can put a note in the event feed and one of us will get back with you. Just as a um, kind of a, a plug, I witnessed, I watched Rick Yang, a high school student, in his talk about high achieving schools yesterday. It's all of about eight or 10 minutes. It was really awesome. And I invite you to join me in watching that. Thank you again for being here. We'll see you at the top of the hour for today's closing keynote. Thank you so much. All right. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.